What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here for a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the principals and associates, as well as the founding sponsors of this great open source organization. Today, newsletter number 15. On June 12, 2019, this week's newsletter summarizes meetings from the coredev.tech event, describes a proposed amendment to BIP 125 replaced by fee, links to the Optech executive briefing video about Schnorr and Taproot, and briefly celebrates the 50th weekly issue of the Optech newsletter. Also included are our regular sections on BEC32 sending support and notable changes to popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items, none this week. News. Bitcoin Core Contributor Meetings Many contributors met in person for a periodic coredev.tech event last week, with real-time transcripts provided by contributor Brian Bishop, the fastest typer of Bitcoin. June 5th, a session on core a code review discussed a survey sent to active Bitcoin Core contributors and developed several suggestions for streamlining reviews. Partially discussed, changing the wallet architecture to use output script descriptors for generating addresses and tracking when they have been paid, and finding or deriving the particular private key necessary for spending. On June 6th, discussion of the consensus cleanup soft fork included its interaction with BIP Taproot, where parts of it should be dropped and whether anything should be added. The group asks what they could do to make the maintainers work easier. Among other consideration, the maintainers noted appreciation for the issues and pull request management provided by longtime contributor Michael Ford. Meeting participants responded to this by granting maintainer status to Ford so that he can be even more effective. Potential script changes were discussed. Discussions of the BIP 118 and BIP any previous output SIG hashes revolved around output tagging, see newsletter 40, 34 and Chaperoon Signatures, see Newsletter 47. The renamed BIP COSHV opcode was reviewed, see Newsletter 48. And OpChaxic from Stack was considered as a generic alternative. A taproot topic included discussions about using a Merkle tree instead of an accumulator and risks related to fast quantum computers. A Q&A session about the U3XO accumulator for the UTXO set highlighted some interesting details of this development proposal for minimizing full node storage requirements. June 7th, the code of the Assume UTXO proposal was demoed and discussed, including how to make the proposal compatible with other ideas. Contributors discussed getting hardware wallet support via HWI directly integrated into Bitcoin Core. A particular concern was code separation, ensuring that the code for specific hardware wallet devices is maintained by the manufacturer and not Bitcoin Core. The version 2 peer-to-peer -peer transaction protocol and related countersign protocol, see newsletter 27, were more discussed. Several possible enhancements were mentioned during the discussion. A review of the SIGNET idea for a testnet-like chain where all blocks are signed by a trusted party focused on the various ways of distributing the signatures. Although just announced this week on the Bitcoin Dev mailing list, blind state chains were also discussed. Proposals to override some BIP125 replace by fee conditions. BIP125 opt-in replace by fee only allows replacing a transaction with a higher fee rate alternative if the replacement increases the total amount of transaction fee paid in the entire mempool. This stops a cheap bandwidth wasting denial of service attack against full nodes, but makes possible a fairly cheap transaction pinning denial of service attack against certain uses of replace by fee, such as in time sensitive protocols like Lightning Network. Several developers have previously attempted to solve this dilemma with the proposal late last year from Matt Carollo containing a possible solution using child pays for parent fee bumping, child pays for parent carve out, see newsletter number 24, and suggesting an alternative workaround that tweaks replace by fee. Rusty Rossell previously discussed this re replace by fee change with Carollo and has further refined it and now proposed it to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list as an addition of a single rule to the BIP 125 rule set. 
This new rule allows any BIP-125 replaceable transaction in the mempool to be fee bumped under two conditions. The version currently in the mempool is below the top 1 million most profitable virtual bytes, the next block area. And the replacement version pays a high enough fee that it will be in the next block area. This would allow any transaction to be fee bumped without considering without consideration of any of that transaction's children, eliminating the problem with pinning. However, anyone using this rule could reduce the overall amount of fee in the mempool and might be able to use it to excessively waste node bandwidth. Several people replied to the proposal, asking questions and offering analysis about these risks. Presentations, the next soft fork. Bitcoin Optech contributor Steve Lee gave a presentation during last month's Optech executive briefing about possible future Bitcoin soft forks. The video is now available. In his presentation, Lee describes the various phases of a soft fork from idea to proposal to implementation to activation. Using this framework, he identifies the current state of Schnorr and Taproot soft forks. See newsletter number 46. The consensus cleanup fork, see newsletter number 36, and the no input soft fork proposal, BIP 118 and any, BIP any brief out, see newsletter 47. Although later in the presentation he provides an overview of the consensus cleanup soft fork, fixing several non urgent problems in the protocol, and the no input proposal, enabling new features for contract protocols such as L2 layer for Lightning Network. His talk and his summary of it uh, focuses on the combined BIP Schnorr, BIP Taproot, and BIP Trap script proposal. After providing a high level overview of Schnorr signatures and signature aggregation, information probably already familiar to readers of this newsletter, Lee builds a significant portion of his presentation around two of three multi sig security for business spenders, a feature used by many businesses today. He first describes the savings available to users of threshold key aggregation, threshold keys, aggregated public keys that only require a subset of the original participants in order to create a valid signature, such as an aggregated key created from three individual keys that can be signed for by any two of the participants for a two of three multi-sig security. The upside of this approach is maximum efficiency and privacy on chain but the downside is required interactivity creating the public key, interactivity creating the signature, and an inability of the key holder to use blockchain data for auditing to determine which subset of them actually participated in signing. Addressing both of the public key interactivity and the signature auditing concerns, Lee uses an easy to understand sequence of illustrated slides to demonstrate an alternative construction proposal possible using a combination of taproots, key path, and script path spending. Three MUSIC style, two of two aggregated public keys are created, one for each of the three possible pairs of signers in a two of three multisig. Because this is MUSIC and of N key aggregation, it does not require interaction. The most likely of these combinations, for example, a hot wallet key and a third party security key, is made available for taproot key path spending allowing an output to be spent using a single aggregated signature that looks like a single SIG spent. The two alternative options, for example, each involving a cold backup key, are placed in the Merkleized abstract syntax tree for the script path spent. This is not as private or as cheap, but is as it provides redundancy. For any of these options, any third party looking at the blockchain data sees only a single signature and no direct information about how many parties are involved. For each of the three key holders, they know which two of the participants' public key were used to create the particular aggregated public key that the spending signature matched, giving them private audibility. Lee concludes that this portion of the talk by summarizing the trade-offs and showing the clear overall benefit of Schnorr and Taproot for current multi-six spenders. In addition to enhancing current use of Bitcoin, he also describes our few our new features that are not currently practical, but which would become so if Schnorr-style signature and the mast-style script trees become available. 
Lee finishes his talk by providing a rough and heavily caveated timeline for when we might see these changes described in his talk. Optech celebrates newsletter number 50. In early June of last year, John Newberry emailed Dave Harding about some plans he had for a new format uh, form Optech organization, including the single sentence, we will also produce some written material, such as weekly and monthly newsletter summaries. Being a bit bored that day, Harding replied back with an unsolicited proof of concept newsletter. Newberry and other early Optech contributors liked it, so a few details were worked out and regular weekly population publication of the newsletter began. 50 issues later, the newsletter has over 2,500 email subscribers and an unknown number of additional unique subscribers via RSS, Twitter, and Max Hillebrand's reading. We have published overall 80, 80, 85,000 worlds overall, about 250 printed pages of content, with draft versions of the newsletter having reviewed a total of 958 comments so far from an amazing team of reviewers who help ensure technical accuracy and readable uh, prose. Announcement of new newsletters have accumulated over 1,300 retreats and 3,000 likes, plus many upvotes on Reddit. Most importantly, we've heard directly from many of our readers that they find this newsletter to be especially useful. We are amazed, gratified, and humbled uh, that a purely technical newsletter focused solely on Bitcoin has received such an amazing reception in its first year of publication. We know you all, you have high, you all have high expectation from us going forward, and we hope that we can live up to those, expect, to those aspirations in our next 50 issues. As always, we thank our founding sponsors and member companies and all the people who have contributed to this newsletter and everyone who has contributed to Bitcoin development in general. Without you, we'd be writing about something much less exciting than the future of money. Well, and as a personal note here from the reader, thank you very much, especially to David Harding uh, for writing over 50 newsletters that are so unspeakably invaluable and so dense with great great knowledge packed into them thank you very much it's a joy to read this every week and it's a joy to share my reading of this to you the listeners thank you very much and upwards and onwards to the next 50 issues back 32 is sending support week 13 of 24 in a series about allowing the people you pay to access all of segwit's multiple benefits back 32 addresses are not the first time some bitcoin users have changed address formats in April 2012, paid to script hash addresses, uh, starting with a three, were introduced and eventually came to use in about 25% of all transaction outputs. This week, we'll look at the re relative spread of adoption uh, for the two different address formats. For reasons we describe later, this cannot be entirely fair comparison, but it may provide us with a rough guide to how, we will, how well we are doing so far with BAC32 adoption. We'll first look at the percentage of outputs per block sent to pay to script hash or native SegWit BAC32 addresses as measured from the day each proposal became active on mainnet. All plots in this section are averaged over 30 days using a simple moving average. We also limit the data points on pay to script hash plot to about two months before SegWit activation so that almost no pay to script hash wrapped SegWit outputs are miscounted as legacy pay to script hash. One particularly unfair aspect of the above plot is that the paid to script hash is really only useful for advanced scripts such as multisig. There are no need uh, and no benefit for anyone using single sig addresses, though starting with one, to upgrade to paid to script hash. By comparison, there are native SegWit addresses for both single sig use pay to witness public key hash and advanced script users pay to witness script hash. To try to make that comparison more fair, the following plot over a smaller data range separates the two uses of native SegWit so that you can compare back 32 pay to witness script hash uses is roughly equivalent to pay to script hash use. Notable, we see that almost all use of native SegWit addresses to date is for single SIG pay to witness public key hash, the pay to script hash actively prior to SegWit activation, which peaks around 25% of all outputs, has not mig migrated to native pay to witness script hash outputs. 
Indeed, when we consider that all Lightning Network deposit transactions, and at least some other on-chain Lightning Network transactions, are using native pay-to-witness script hash outputs, it appears that if almost none of the late 2017 pay-to-script hash activity has converted to pay-to-witness script hash so far. This point to another aspect that makes the different address data harder to compare. All the things that were possible using legacy pay-to-script hash are also possible using either pay-to-script hash wrapped SegWit addresses or native pay-to-script hash pay-to-witness script hash addresses. Hmm? Pay to script hash wrapped address are backwards compatible and can be significantly reduced transaction fees, whereas BAC32 addresses are not backwards compatible with older wallets and only save a small fixed amount of extra fee compared to pay to script hash wrapped SegWit. This may give us give users of advanced script less incentives than other users to switch from pay to script hash wrapped SegWit addresses to native SegWit addresses in the short term. Overall, the plot seems to show that it took about three years for pay to script hash addresses to really start taking off, but that back 32 addresses were already successful within just a few months of the SegWit software activation, with some wallets already defaulting to back 32 and several more planning to do so in the coming months. We expect to see the increased adoption before the end of 2019. Notable code and documentation changes this week in Bitcoin Core. L&D, C-Lightning, Eclair, LibSec P256K1, and the Bitcoin improvement proposals. This L&D change allows L&D to calculate the probability that a particular route will succeed. If that uses, it then uses that probability to choose the best route in combination with the existing calculations of the total fee cost and maximum HTLC timeout for the path. Several new configuration options are added that allow the user to tweak constant values used in the probability calculation, such as the assumed success probability of a hop in a route when no other information is available. The author of the pull request also discusses routing success probability in his talk last week at the Breaking Bitcoin conference. The C Lightning change changes how C Lightning keeps track of which channel updates it has gossiped to its peers. Previously, a map was kept for each peer tracking which updates had been sent and which were waiting to be sent. Now, a single ordered list of updates is kept by the entire uh, program, and each peer connection simply tracks how far it, has, uh, it is through sending all the entries in that list. When all connections reach the end of the list, its position is marked so that it can send any new entries that are subsequently added to the list. When a later update makes a previous update irrelevant, the previous update is removed from the global list and any connections that have not sent that update will never see it. In testing, presumably as part of the million channel project, this reduced overall memory usage by 35%, about 150 megabytes, and, speed up, and sped up sending all gossip announcements to all peers by 62%, or about 11 seconds. Peers, you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Thank you again to all the founding sponsors, principals, and associates of this great open source organization. Thank you very much, and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.